our um, reading today, which I'm going to focus on, is from the Old Testament. It's from Genesis chapter 32, reading from verse 22 through to verse 32. This is the account of Jacob wrestling with God. At the same night he, that is Jacob, arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out a joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to them, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Let's be honest, at face value, this is quite a perplexing story. Let's be honest. It's a bit weird. It's a bit perplexing. A man comes down and wrestles with Jacob, wounds him, and then um, says he's God. But, you know, God says, hey, you know, this man says, hey, give up wrestling with me not until you bless me and he blesses him and given him his new name so how do we get our head around this and the real question is what how does this word speak to us in this day and age today I know I've said this before friends but I want to reiterate it's very important that as Christians as followers of Jesus we read the Old Testament which is the course the story of and the writings of the Old Covenant, we read them through a New Covenant lens. Okay, Because remember, this is the story of the people of old, the people of Israel who lived under the Old Covenant, but of course the coming of Jesus was a defining a defining moment in the history of God's salvation, of the salvation of God's people. And Jesus redefined the way in which people relate to God, now through him. So it doesn't make the Old Testament any less the Word of God, but we need to read it through what I say is a Christocentric lens, a Christ-centered lens. In other words, we ask the question, how can this Word breathe insight and life into our relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ our Saviour? That's how we must, I believe, approach the Old Testament. So what can we learn from this account? Well, the first thing I believe it's important we do is look at this in the context of the story. So I want us just to very briefly, you can read this. I encourage you to go back to about Genesis 28 and a little bit before even and read this in the context of the whole story of Jacob. Uh, this is just a summary. Jacob was the son of Isaac, who of course was the son of Abraham. Isaac's wife, Isaac married Rebekah, gave birth to two sons. There were twins wrestling in a room, womb. One was Jacob, one was called Esau. Esau, remember, was had red hair, was hairy and red. There were and and they wrestled in her womb, and there was a prophetic word. There were two nations in her womb. 
The scripture says that Isaac loved Esau more, whereas Rebekah loved Jacob more. We read that Jacob was, um, he was a bit of a schemer. Now, God had plans for him, but he certainly wasn't perfect. He blackmailed Esau out of his birthright. Jacob deceived Esau out of his blessing from his father Isaac. Esau threatened revenge, so Jacob fleed and lived with his uncle Laban, which is where he met his wife, first Leah, then Rachel, and had children. And his life was one of trickery and deceit, but Laban was pretty that way as well. It came back to bite Jacob because I, Laban did the same to him. He tricked him. And so that was, there was this web of trickery and deceit. And in the events, uh, Isaac, uh, sorry, Jacob left Laban. And it was as he and his family were moving out of Laban's territory that we have this encounter here where this man wrestled with Jacob. We read that Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. So both Jacob, God and Jacob in the text identify then, it's just a man, but then they identify him as God. In other words, through this wrestling, God was manifesting himself through this man in some way that identified with God. He said, you've striven with God and men and have prevailed. Jacob said, I've seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. So what's going on here? He's the God of heaven and earth revealing himself in the form of this man who was wrestling with Jacob, who appeared from nowhere and instigated this wrestle. That's the other thing. Jacob didn't begin this. This man did. Now, what is this all about? What does this mean? Because, as I said, Jacob was holding his ground. The scripture said that Jacob was prevailing. Now, this in itself is confusing, isn't it? Because if this was God revealing himself through Jacob, we're talking about the omnipotent God of heaven and earth. He could have totally wiped Jacob out within the first session, second of the wrestle. True? And yet this is a wrestling and Jacob's prevailing against him. What is this about? So if it's God revealing himself through this man, what's going on here? It seems that despite him being the omnipotent father at heaven and earth, he wrestled with Jacob and Jacob prevailed. Now, friends, this isn't the first time that God revealed himself in some way on earth, and it wasn't the last either. Remember the father was walking through the Garden of Eden, Remember that he was there even in the time of Moses, the cloud of glory. He didn't see his face, but, but, but he was there. And then in the future, remember Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he thought he was wiped out because he got a vision of the Lord. So God would, from time to time, reveal himself on earth. A foretaste of what was to come in the future when he would fully reveal himself, wouldn't he, in the babe of Bethlehem, who would be, this would be Emmanuel, God with us, who would live with us and fulfill his purposes. So what do we learn from this? If we look at it through the eyes of, of, of the New Covenant, the New Testament, what can we learn from this? What is God wanting us to learn and know through this? I want to suggest to you that maybe one thing we're to learn is there are times when our relationship with God will be like a wrestle. Sometimes it may feel like we're wrestling with ourselves. Sometimes it may feel like we're wrestling with others. And sometimes God will be in the midst of that wrestling as he was with Jacob. You see, God does not separate himself from our lives. God doesn't separate himself from our relationship, friends. But he is, God is a relational God and he is inextricably intertwined with us. 
and our relationships in our life. Now, let me be very clear here. I think we need to be here clear because there's a fine line. That does not mean that God is us or we are them, as the New Age philosophy believes. God is separate from us. He is creator and we are created. But through the work of Jesus, we are we reconcile with God. God's spirit is within us. When his spirit was poured out on all flesh, God is here and God is at work in the world and God is at work in every part of our lives. God, out of his love for us, has manifest himself in our lives. His desire is to bless us, to bring about his purposes with us and within us. So what does that mean? When you think of our lives, there are times where it's hard. It's like a wrestle. It could be situations that are causing us grief. It could be situations with others where it's a wrestle, it's just a struggle, where life becomes a struggle. And we can too quickly conclude, well, this is not of God. It may not be of God. It may be of the enemy. Satan really is our opposer. He is the one who comes to rob and kill and destroy. It can be of Satan. And if it is obviously evil, it is not of God. Sickness, sin and evil are not of God. They're attempts of the enemy to destroy us. But just because things are not going our way, just because it's a battle, it doesn't necessarily mean if it doesn't fit into those categories... It doesn't necessarily mean it's the enemy. What if God is in the struggle? What if God is in the wrestling? What if God has his purposes for us in and through the times of challenge and the times of struggle? To ask the question, Lord, where are you in this, is a valid question. God may be there. God may have lessons that he wants to teach us. God may be in the struggle and, like Jacob, we may even be wounded in the struggle, just as Jacob was. We may be in the reality of living our lives in this world and in the wrestling, we may be wounded. We may struggle, and it may hurt. But just as it was with Jacob, the higher there may be, excuse me, higher purposes of God there, if we prevail as Jacob did. If we persist as Jacob did. If we draw on God's help and strength to persevere, like Jacob, blessing will come. Because God's promise is to bless. The heart of God is to bless. The blessings are always God's undeserved favour. That's what he desires for us. But we in our humanity just want the blessings to come. We're human, we're carnal, and we just want blessings without struggle. Blessings, yes. Struggle, no. Blessings are good. Struggle, bad. Give it to me the easy way, God. But often our growth, our capacity to prevail, our resilience for the things of life and the things of the kingdom come through wrestling. They come through the wrestle. And that's what we can learn from this. I believe there's a few other things, friends, we can learn from this story as well. True blessings come from God not from us. Let's go back to the story. This man, whom God was speaking through and working through, said to Jacob, it's daybreak, give up. <laughs> and Jacob, not until you bless me. You've got to admire his hide, <laughs> for want of a better word. But God did. But God did. And this whole experience was a big learning from Jacob. Jacob learned 
You can't get blessing through deception. Jacob deceived Esau out of his blessing. Remember the story? Isaac, the story was Isaac was, was, was old and he was hard of seeing. And, and so he said to Esau, go and fetch me, uh, kill some game and fetch me the, my favourite meal and I will bless you. And remember, with the help of Rebecca, Isaac went out and uh, got the meal and did it himself and she dressed him in some hairs and that so he could father could feel him because he couldn't see him and he blessed him and said, now, many years later, Jacob was learning. You can't get blessings through deception. Because that's what we see in this world, don't we? Unfortunately, we see people wanting the good things through deceptive ways. And even if not through deceptive ways, through human ways. But true blessings cannot be concocted within the confines of our humanity, friends. True blessings come from God, and that's what God was teaching Jacob here. You can't, you can't force it. In other words, when we try to make it happen, when we try to take control, when we think we know how to bring the blessings, and we try to do it ourselves in our own strength with our own resources, all we're going to do is get tired and weary and disillusioned. What this teaches us, as friends, is this is why all of what we've been doing in our worship, all of us, we declared that psalm by looking to the Lord and declaring and worshipping him and declaring that all that we have that is of value, that is eternal, that is of purposeful, comes from him, not from us. And Isaac was getting that message through. But there's something else we learn, isn't there? As I said, if you get a chance where well, I encourage you to make the time to read the story of Jacob, you'll see that he, as I said earlier, he was no paragon of virtue. He was deceptive. He was conniving. But God didn't give up on him. God did not give up on him. This was happening this encounter happened because the god of steadfast love and faithfulness stayed with him just as he does you and me just as he does us isn't it wonderful to know that despite our shortcomings despite our failings despite the fact that we mess it up our God does not give up on us because he is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of love. And just as God had a plan and purpose for Jacob, he, Jacob, had a part to play in the ongoing fulfillment of the promise of Abraham because it came from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob and then through Joseph and, and on it went. God had a plan and purpose and God did not give up in spite of his imperfections. God has a plan and purpose for you and me and despite our shortcomings, he does not give up and he continues to desire to bless us. And when we prevail in the wrestling, when we don't hold back, but when we draw strength from him, when we trust him, when we push through in these times, when we discern what is of the enemy and what is of God, and know that there are times when he is with us in the wrestling of life and prevail, the blessings will come. Look at the blessing here. God blessed I, Jacob in this way. He, said, you know, he gave him a new name. He said, your name will now be Israel. The Hebrew word Israel has several meanings, friends. In the true Hebrew language, it can mean, may God contend. It can mean, may God rule, and it can mean, persevere. This, of course, was the name that was given not only to Jacob, but those who would follow him, the people of Israel, the chosen people, those called out by God to deliver his purposes on earth. And we, as the followers of Jesus, are the new Israel, we are the people of God birthed out of the covenant with the shed blood of Jesus. We are the new Israel. So that is a word to us. May God contend. May God rule. May God may and persevere. They are words over our life. They are an expression of the blessing of God to us. 
So, friends, if I can sum all this up today, I would say this. The blessing of God is found in and through our persistent engaging with the Lord. Our struggling, our wrestling in the midst of that in life, he comes to us and engages with us in the joys and challenges of everyday life. Let there be no mistaking, because God is a God of amazing love, sometimes the blessings just come without the struggle. That's because God is who he is, and we are thankful for those times. We are thankful when the favour comes. We are thankful from right, left field, they come. But let's not make the mistake then of assuming, because what can often happen then is our flesh can get in and, Lord, just continue it that way all the time more lord more of your blessings that way yes he will but sometimes the blessing will come through the wrestling through the struggling with the everyday life let's be discerning not spiritualize it all and say every time there's a bit of struggle it's the enemy be discerning is it of satan well there it is then take authority over it because god has given us authority resist the devil and he will flee but let's be discerning. Lord, is this you in the struggle? Are you through this, using this to refine us, to strengthen our faith in you, to release within us a resilience that we may reflect your light and love and hope within the kingdom? And through this, your blessing comes to us as it did through Jacob. He's a wonderful God. He's an amazing God. He's a God of everlasting love and faithfulness that endures throughout all generations. And more than ever, friends, he needs a faithful people, a people who will hold fast in the challenges of this world. He needs a people who will not just hide behind religious enclaves and just be seen as those who go to church in those big Gothic buildings or wherever they worship and come out and get on with their lives. No, he needs a people more than ever who will fulfill the declaration of Jesus. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are to stand out. You are to be different. And you are to be prevail. Let us be those people. Let us see those people, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord within us. Amen.